Good morning this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad to have you with us. As we begin this morning, I want to mention two things. Uh, the next two Sundays, we're going to have guest speakers, so we won't be online. And then following that, we're probably going to take two Sundays and have in-house services. And we'll speak about ministry uh, coming in the fall and opportunities and just context and all kind of things. So I just want to communicate that to you. We'll be saying more online and to you who are part of the Emmanuel family, we'll be communicating to you specifically as well. So we want to thank you for coming this morning. We are wrapping up the Gospel of John this morning. I can't believe it. We've been in it two years. Um, and today we come to chapter 21. We're going to wrap it up. We have seen uh, Jesus Christ in the flesh. Uh, he's such an encouragement to my faith every day. As I look at him, I look at his life, his ministry, his love, his grace, how he displayed just a servant's heart and all that he did, uh, how he sacrificially gave for us. We really see God the Father through the lens of Christ, and He teaches us we can have an intimate relationship with the Father through Him. We can know the Father through Him. So today as we come to the Gospel of John, as we finish up, we are indeed in chapter 21. We're actually going to finish up the whole chapter, and we are again meeting God face to face in the person of Christ. Today we're taking a final look at grace. John has been about grace in Christ the grace of salvation, the, the grace of relationship, the grace of forgiveness, the grace of, of, of just the peace of God and, and just all that the Lord offers to us through His work on our behalf at the cross. We are reminded in Titus that God's grace has appeared. It's appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen that grace firsthand. We've seen it in the Old Testament as God dis revealed Himself to us. And then just in the living flesh, Jesus Christ came. The grace of God is given to us uh, really for specific purposes. One is, is to bring salvation into our hearts, into our life. The other is to change us. It's to transform us. It's to train us so that we might live for Jesus Christ. It's really important here that we see this. The grace of God has also been given to us so that we might, we might make right choices, that we will step away from the life of sin that defined us before we met Christ. And then in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can say yes to what God wants us to do. And we say no to the pull that the sinful desire still has in our life. We renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. But that we live for Christ. That we live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in, in this present age. And we're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting for Christ to come back. Grace moves us forward in this relationship, this kind of relationship. We are personally, one-on-one, -on -one, walking with the Lord. I want to look at how grace is expressed here in this final chapter in the life of Jesus Christ and ultimately to us. So let's pick it up in chapter 21 and let's begin in uh, the first seven verses. John says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, two different names, same, same place, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, it's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. And they went out and got in a boat, but that night they caught nothing. So Jesus promised, he had told his disciples, Go into Galilee and I'll meet you there. He's met with them twice already. And so, and while they're waiting for Jesus to come, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. That's what is his comfort level. He's a fisherman. And so they, a number of the disciples go fishing. Verse 4, And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. And yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. You have the, it's dusk, maybe, maybe a fog on the water. The lighting is not quite where they can see who this is. And they did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They said to him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, It, it is the Lord. And John comes to the realization right then and there, it's Jesus Christ on the shore. They weren't sure. But what we see here in, in these early verses, we see the grace of God 
as he meets the needs of disciples. Here it's just the needs to catch fish. It's just the it's just the uh, the need of life. They're going fishing not only to cope and to and to, and to, and to um, relax, but but to again earn money as they did before um, to meet needs, maybe to replenish funds. Who knows what? But but they're going fishing, and Jesus comes along, and uh, he. You know, whether they need this fish to survive now, they've been with Jesus these three years. Uh, they're going to they're gonna step into a new ministry when Jesus leaves. It's not going to be fishing. It's going to be fishers of men. But Jesus Christ, just out of his love and grace, meets this, this need, this desire that they have to, to catch this fish and to be able to use those funds for ways only he knows. But it just reminds us, it teaches us, God is always meeting needs in our life. He's constantly doing that. Jesus Christ did that throughout this gospel. We were reminded in Philippians, my God shall meet all of your needs, every need that you have. He's going to supply for every need according to his riches or his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, God has promised us that. And when we have needs met, you know, we, uh, we're to just remember to thank the Lord. Lord, I thank you. Have you thanked the Lord this week for just the ways he's met needs in your life? How has he been faithful to you this week and just and just given attention to the needs of your life and cared about those things? Even small things, big things. Romans 8, 32 is a reminder to us. He cares about those things. And how did he show that? He graciously gave up his life. If he gave up his own life for us, which he did, and it's just so fresh right here to these men, what Jesus just, just did. They've just seen the scars in his hands and his feet and his side. And, and now as they... As they encounter him again he's just caring about them their life needs he reaches out to them uh they've been fishing all night they're frustrated this is their this is their trade this is what they do they do it well they've spent all night and they've come up empty nothing they've not caught one fish jesus says throw the net on the other side and they and they and they, and they catch so much fish and then john realizes this is the lord this is the lord Jesus Christ comes, and what he first does here in this chapter is he re-engages them here in Galilee. Is he simply just he simply just meets a need that they care about? Uh, what a wonderful Savior to reach into our lives. This isn't a spiritual thing; it's simply a life need. He cares about that. You know, we're not to be so so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We're not to be so spiritual that we can't engage in this world. You know. We have needs and we have things in our life that we pray for the Lord to meet. Sometimes they're just physical in nature, but they're important to us because they, <clears throat> they're an important element of our life for, for reasons that, that we know and God knows. And God reaches into our life and He meets those needs. He's gracious in that. I want you to see that here this morning as we look at Him. So we look at what He does. And then we continue on and we go to verse 7 and verse 8. We, we finished in verse 7 and we pick it up. So John says it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, because he didn't know for sure, he put on his outer garment, he'd taken off his outer garment to fish so it wouldn't get all dirty. For he was stripped for work, not naked, but he had his, his undergarments on. He had his, with the, just, the, just the minimum garb so, they, so he could function and, and work smoothly. And, and uh, he put his outer garment on and he, th he threw himself into the sea. And the, and the other disciples came in the boat. And they're dragging this net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, about 100 yards, but they're having to drag this, this, this net full of fish. We're going to see how significant that is in a second. And so Peter just leaves them behind. He hears John say, it's a Lord. And the, and the very first response, the very first response of Peter is to jump in the water and is to swim as fast as he can to Jesus. It's an amazing picture. This is an amazing picture. Because you remember, Peter now has, has seen Jesus Christ twice. In the, in, is there in this room, maybe the upper room, they're hiding, I don't know where it was, but they're, they're, they're in a place, they're hiding. Jesus appears in their midst, and then a week later, he appears again where you have Doubting Thomas. And Peter sees him twice, but, but we don't get any picture yet that Peter had one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And Peter has denied Jesus three times. And so weighing heavily on his heart, heavily on his heart, is what he did, is the failure in his life. 
when he when Jesus looked at him when he betrayed him that third time and that rooster crowed, when Jesus looked at him, Peter went out and he and he wept bitterly. It says he was crushed, he was destroyed, he was distraught, he was crushed in every way, and so he's he's carried that. You know what that feels like. We know what that feels like to carry. On, a, as a weight on our heart, something that we've done, that we know is wrong. We have hurt someone deeply. We've offended them deeply. We have sinned against them deeply. And we carry it with us. And Peter feels this here. And, and what we tend to do when we, when we see that person and the persons is we tend to shy away. We tend to go the other way. We tend to give the cold shoulder. We, we tend to not know what to do. And, and Peter does the right thing here, and it teaches us so much because here's what, here's what grace shows us here in these verses. We see the grace of a wooed heart. A heart that, is, that has been drawn to Jesus Christ. A heart that understands that Jesus loves him so much. That Jesus has forgiven him. That Jesus just died for him, Peter. Peter understands Jesus. He just died for me. I know he loves me. I grieved him so much, but his first response is to run to the Savior. That's what the Lord wants you to do. That's what he wants me to do when I've got sin in my life. He wants me to run to him and to make it right. That's his desire. Jeremiah 31 reminds us, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I'm faithful to you. I'm still faithful to you. Peter knew that here. Peter knew from Psalm 86, Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you are gracious. Lord, you are slow to anger. Your love, it abounds. It's steadfast. It continues. You are faithful to me. Peter knew these things deep in his heart. When we are caught in sin, we can still understand by the Spirit of God who Jesus Christ is, that these qualities and these characteristics of Jesus still apply to us. And it, and by the Spirit of God, it, it draws us to Christ. And we can run to Christ and find forgiveness and healing and love. Not, not judgment, but love. Psalm 147 reminds us that He heals us. When we're broken, when we've been wounded, you know, Peter knew that. that. Jesus is the only place, person he could go to. The one he had offended and hurt and grieved so dearly and so deeply, yet he was the only one who would look upon Peter with love and grace. And he says, I'd rather place my hands in I'd rather place myself into the hands of my Savior, who I know loves me, than to the hands of my of my enemies who I know hate me. And he ran to Jesus Christ because he knew his love. Jesus is the only one who can create something new in us, who can renew that relationship in us. He's the one who does that. And when we sinned, the scriptures just call us to make it right, to confess it, to repent, and to be drawn back into fellowship and praise. That's what Peter did. Peter remembered here that God loved him so much he died for him. God loved us so much that when we were sinners, when we sinned against him, he died on the cross for us. What a, what a picture of grace. Verses 9 through 14 And when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. And Jesus said, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And so Simon went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of the large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They know who it is, but they're, they don't want to ask. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Here we see the grace of, of hospitality. We see the grace of relationship. Jesus comes and he serves them. He meets with them. He, he fixes a meal for them. He meets them where they're at. And he just loves them. He sits down and he just has a meal with them. And he fixes this food and he just, he just serves them. He communes with them. It's just a beautiful time of being together. After all that's happened, after the disciples ran from the cross and hid, Jesus now calls them back together and they just have a meal together. 
And he conveys in that his love for them. Takes us back to the upper room when Jesus transformed the Passover to the Lord's Supper. And he broke the bread and poured the cup and, and he just shared that meal with them. It reminds us of Acts. God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He's now appeared. The, 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 the uh, disciples remind us He appeared to us. Us He appeared to. And we ate and we drank with Him. Right here, right here in this passage. We ate and we drank with Him. And we just we had a meal. And it was real. And it was authentic. And He's real. We saw Him eat. And, and we just had a meal together. What a beautiful time of fellowship. And Jesus just wants that with you. He, he wants that time of communion. He wants that time of fellowship with you. He wants... He wants me with him. He wants you with him. He wants us to, to sit down with him and just have and just commune with him and, and just interact with him. Let him into our life. Speak into our life and love us in all the corners and crevices of our life and just let him be with us and enjoy his presence. Jesus says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. Boy, that's, that's hospitality. That's fellowship. That's communion. Forever and ever and ever. Revelation, he's speaking to believers here. This, we think of this as a salvation passage, invitation. It is, but it's, it's, it's written to believers here to, to listen to him and be restored, to repent, hear him, hear my voice, open the door, and let him come in. Let him come back into my life. He's, written, he's writing to believers here. A church here of believers. He says, there's sin here. Open the door and listen to me. Let me come back into your life and... Let's commune and let's have fellowship again. Let's break the bread again. Let's, let's just talk about your life. Let me show you my life, scars, my love, my grace. Enjoy me again. Just enjoy my presence. Let's fellowship again. He's calling you and I to do that. Just enjoy Him. Enjoy the Lord. And let Him love us to the very depths of our life. Every corner. Revelation 19 reminds us there's a marriage supper of the Lamb coming. We're going to sit down. We're going to have a meal with the Lord. This could be quite an extensive time we're with the Lord doing this. And it's by, it's by invitation only. That invitation is the cross. The invitation is the Spirit of God touching your heart and mind and wooing us and drawing us to Him so that we might be saved and receive Him as Savior. And then He says, I want to sit down. I want to have a meal. I want to celebrate with you. All my riches, I want to celebrate with you. All my blessings, I want to settle, celebrate with you. you just, I want you to sit down at a table with me. And I'm going to share all those things with you. That's what He wants in your relationship with you today, with us. He wants to celebrate that relationship. He wants to dine with us. He wants to share all that is His with us. Sin stands in the way of that. And when we confess that, that fellowship is, is pure. We have a clean conscience before the Lord. We can sit down with Him. And when sin stands between us, we can be like Peter and run to Him and find grace and be restored and then enjoy this communion of just fellowship. Verses 15 to 17. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now that these, we don't know what they are. Do you love me more than these? These fish, what we're eating? Do you love me more than this food? It could be, Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these men right here, these disciples? Do you love me more than them? It's not clear. It's one of those. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Of course, it's phileo love here. Love here. It's, it's the love of friendship. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He asked him again, same, do you love me? With that friend, with the depth in your heart, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend to my sheep, feed them, tend to them. And he said to him a third time, Simon of John, do you love me? And the love here is agape. It is that unconditional love. Do you love me unconditionally? No matter what, do you love me with this kind of love? Do you love me better than these? Do you love me as, as the highest priority in your life? Do you love me like that? And, and, John, and Peter, was, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Maybe, maybe what's going back in Peter's mind is, uh-oh, I betrayed him and 
Maybe, I don't know what's going on in his mind. I don't know what's going on in his mind, but he's grieved. And he says, Lord, Lord, you know everything. You know, you know that I love you. And Peter does love the Lord with all of his heart, and all of his soul, and all of his mind. He failed terribly and miserably. But the Lord knows, and we know as we look at Peter, his expression here is genuine. Lord, you know that I love you. You know, and Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The beauty of what's happening here is this. In those three questions, the Lord is bringing Peter to a, to a, a moment of clarity. Peter, I'm restoring you to ministry. Feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. Feed my sheep. I'm giving you responsibility, Peter. Peter, I'm giving you a charge. Peter, I'm giving you a mission. Peter, I'm restoring you back to leadership among the among the twelve. The new one's going to be chosen in Acts 1, a new disciple. I'm giving you leadership here. You didn't blow it, and now I want nothing to do with you. No, Peter. Peter. Peter, I love you. I'm going to put opportunity back in your hands because I know, Peter, you love me. You know, when we sin, the Lord still knows, us, knows our heart. David, David committed adultery, King David, and he, and he committed murder. And yet, yet he's the only man, Scripture says, he was a man after God's own heart. How is that true? Because he sinned terribly against God. But he, he was broken terribly before the Lord. In, in a brokenness and a contrite heart, he came and repented of his sin. And he confessed his sin and he followed after Jesus. He followed after God with his, with his whole heart. And you see that. And God used him and God loved him. And the same thing in our life. It's not our failures. Don't let your failure define you. Let the grace of God define you this morning. Be drawn to him, to his love and his grace, and let him restore and use you in, in place within your heart purpose for him and a mission for him. You can be used of God no matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what's happened in your past. God wants to use you. He loves you this morning. You're, if you are a child of God, you are precious in his sight. He wants to transform your heart and your past and make it a future that is his. And he can do that. He restores us. We're reminded in Acts, repent. Turn back that our sins might be blotted out. Make it right with God. And then God pours refreshing into our life. He makes everything right. And the presence of the Lord is the game changer in our life. When we walk in the presence of the Lord, we, we are shaped by that grace, not by the failure. Psalm 12 reminds us, God, restore to me joy. Give me joy. Give me joy. Uphold me. Lift me up. Put me on solid ground. Give me a willing spirit. God, move me forward. Fill my life with joy again. That's what, that's what forgiveness does. When He forgives us, He cleanses us. And he, he gives us joy again. The sin doesn't hold us back anymore. It's not the weight. Because it's been, it's been forgiven. It's been washed. It's been cleansed. And, and now I'm in fellowship with the Lord again. And then He sustains us. He gives us a willing spirit. He's the one who heals us. He's the one who saves us. He becomes our praise. We see that here. What a beautiful thing. And then we see grace as we move forward. Verses 18 and 19. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, when you were young, uh, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. You went wherever you wanted. Oh, but Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and will carry you where you do not want to go. You think, well, maybe that's old age and he has to be carried, but that's not what he's talking about here. Verse 19, verse 19 this he said to show by what kind of death that he was going to glorify God. He, he is showing Peter you're going to be crucified. Your hands are going to be stretched out and laid out just as mine was. Your clothes are going to be stripped away. You're going to be carried on this cross. You're going to be tortured. It's going to be a terrible thing. But Peter, Peter, in that you're going to bring honor to me. You're going to glorify me. I am going to be exalted through your life. I'm going to use your life. And then he said here at the end of verse 19, after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. This is, a, this is a difficult area that we sometimes don't want to come face to face with. 
I tell you what, the grace of God is precious in our life. We sing of grace, amazing grace. My chains are gone. We, we sing of the grace of God all the time. How it, is, how it is everything that we need. Every day, the grace of God meets needs. But let me just remind you, the grace of God is, is more than just God's provision into our life for the things that we want. The grace of God is a call in our life. It's a call in our life. It is a high call. It is a a life-changing call. He says to Peter here, Peter, I'm going to use you. You're going to be a a tool, a vessel in my hand. I'm going to use you for my glory. I had to bring Peter absolute joy. After he failed him, after he betrayed Jesus Christ, God says to Peter, Peter, I'm going to use you. You are going to bring honor to me. Your life, your death, is going to be a trophy of my grace. It's going to be a trophy of my stamp on your life. People are going to be drawn to Christ because of your life. Peter had to be encouraged by that. Even though he saw now the end that would come after he has seen Jesus Christ die for him and rise from the dead and stand here before him and forgive him and restore him, Peter, Peter is like Mary Magdalene who had those seven demons and God released her from that. She was devoted to Christ the rest of her life and Peter is, Peter is devoted to Jesus Christ no matter. And Jesus says, after he shares, this is the kind of death you're going to have, the Lord says to Peter, now Peter, follow me. Philippians 1.9 It's been granted to you, you and I, you and I, believers, that for the sake of Christ, Not only are we going to believe in Him, we are called to suffer for His sake. Every child of God is called called to a path that requires and involves suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. When we identify with Christ, we will suffer because of that in this world. It is a promise to you. You can count on it, and you can count on God's grace being with you. Is Is that an element of grace that you and I are willing to receive? Well, it is if we love Him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. It is if we understand how much He loved us, that He gave His life for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is worth it no matter what He asks us to do. It's worth it to identify with Him in suffering, no matter what it is, because of what He's done for us, what He's called us to. First Peter reminds us, Peter's writing this, Peter's writing this, after you have suffered oh, just a little while, just a little while, The grace of God who has called you to His eternal, that's forever, glory in Christ. He will restore you, confirm you, strengthen, establish you. Peter says, you know what? Whatever, whatever I'm about to face, whatever I have faced, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. Eternal reward, eternal relationship, eternal life in Christ, it is worth it. It is worth it. I say to you this morning, child of God, it's worth it to identify with Christ. It doesn't matter what it costs you in your life. Give it up. Let it go. Don't fight against the people who hate us. Love them with grace. Don't fight against the things that are unfair against you in your life. Receive it with grace. Be a testimony for Christ. Don't fight the difficult people in your life. Love them with grace. Suffer with a testimony for Christ. Suffer for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5.11 Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say false things against you that are evil because of me. Don't have a retort. Don't have a response. Don't flame back on social media. Don't crucify the person. Don't be hateful towards those people. With grace and love, love them. Show them Christ. Suffer for the identity of Christ and do it with joy. And do it with with grace. Let grace change and transform the character of your life. Let the character of your life be holy. Let the character of your life be Christ. It's part of knowing Him. Lord, I want, Paul says, I want to know You. I want to know You. I want to share in that relationship. I want to share in Your sufferings. I want to identify with Christ. I want to know what it means to suffer for Christ. Because, Lord, 
You willingly suffered for me on my behalf. That's what I want. I want to become like you. I want to. I want to. I want to become like you. I want to know what. It, I don't want to know what it means to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ, as you suffered for me. And then verses twenty to twenty-five. And Peter turned and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. So apparently they're walking now. Peter and Jesus, and now John's following. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper, the upper room, and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Because John had been right next to Jesus, and he had looked up when everyone was wondering who it was. And he said, ask him, ask him. Peter said to John, ask him. And so John looks up to Jesus and said, who is it? And so this is the one. And when Peter saw him, John, verse 21, we saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And so the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? The issue isn't whether John would live forever or not. He wouldn't. He would die. He would for Jesus Christ. The issue here is, is Peter. It's grace. It's the grace of this reality. For you listening this morning right now, if you're a child of God, God has a plan for you, a specific plan for you. It's tailored for just you. Only you. If you're listening with other people sitting next to you right now, God has a plan for you that is yours, not the person next to you might involve the person next to you, might impact the person next to you, but God has a plan just for you. He wants to use you specifically. Jesus says to Peter, when Peter said to him, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said, if it's my will that he remain until he come, what is that, what is that to you, Peter? You, you, Peter, you follow me. Don't worry about my plans for John. You worry about my path for your life. That's what you focus on. Let us not be consumed with, with what we think God should be doing in the lives of other people. We pray for other people. We minister to other people in need. We see needs in their life. But we are not agents of God's leading in their life. We are maybe agents of grace to try to touch their life with, 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 uh, with the work of God. But we are not God's sovereign agent in their life. God has a plan for their life. We must focus and and pray over our own hearts that we might be instruments in God's hands. Say, just this, God, use me today. God, use me. Show me my path today. Help me not to be consumed with her, with him, with this, with that. God, use me. Keep me focused on what you want me to do as I engage him or her or this path. God, me, 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 me. God, teach me. God, give me grace. Show me your plan for me. Peter here is concerned about John. The Lord had just told Peter, you're going to be crucified. So John's love for, Peter's love for John is, what's going to happen to John? Some say, well, Peter here is jealous. I don't think so. I think Peter here is expressing a love. What's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to him? Basically, God says, Jesus says to Peter, it's in my hands. I'll take care of Peter, just, or John, just like I'm taking care of you. Trust me, Peter. And just follow me. Just follow me. This is the disciple, verse 24, who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So much here. It ends with this challenge to Peter. Peter, just follow me. There's much more that could be said, but it ends with God ministering to Peter and ultimately to us. God says to you and I this morning, I just want to use your life. I want to touch you specifically. By grace, I will give you what you need. Don't let your failures define you. Let me create successes in your life. Let me use you to touch and impact the lives of other people. But you be focused on you, that God might use you to impact people. Don't try to change their life. Try to love them. Try to extend grace to them. Focus on your life, your testimony, your witness. Psalm 32, Jesus, I will instruct you, 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 and teach you in the way that you should go. 
I will counsel you, and my eye will be upon you. That's a verse for us just to bring into our life. That's a great verse to be reminded. The Lord wants to touch your life. He wants to touch the lives of people that, that are in your world and in your sphere. He may not use you to do that, but it's your life He wants to touch first. If you're on fire for God, if you have a passion for holiness and for doing what God wants you to do, you will impact people. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I I trust. Make me, make me know the way that I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. John is about meeting God face to face, and in doing so we meet Christ. We see the Father face to face through that, through that, that grace of Christ, that extended grace of Christ all the way through this gospel. We see the grace of God in Christ. Let the grace of God touch your heart this morning. Father, we pray this morning that you would just remind us that you love us. You love us so much. All of us have failed. Every one of us. Yet in your grace, you, you open your arms and you just say, come to me. Lord, you give us relationship. You give us opportunity. You strengthen us. Enable us. You use us. You have a plan specifically for our own life to identify with you and be used for you. God, show us what that is and give all of us a willing spirit, a yielded, submissive spirit to you. May we bend our will to your plan for our life. And may your grace flow through us and impact to others. May our witness for Christ be clear in all that we do, that people might be saved and drawn to Jesus Christ, as is the goal of this gospel. Touch our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. We thank the Lord for this gospel of John into our life. May it transform your life and change you. We will be back together again. We'll be communicating. But uh, thanks again for being with us this morning.